Hi, and uh, welcome to uh, tonight's event, um, Don't Stop Until All Your Enemies Are Dead, a conversation on survival and style in American letters. I am Michael Miller. Um, I'm an editor at Book Forum, and we're here tonight to celebrate the new issue, which I have right here. The, of Octavia E. Butler on the cover. Um, and also to talk about um, an essay that appears in the, in the issue by Christian Lorenzen. Um, it's his review of Blake Bailey's new biography of Philip Roth, um, which opens with the statement, more than realism and its rivals, the dominant literary style in America is careerism and goes on to say that the original and so far ultimate careerist in American literature was Philip Roth. Um, I'm gonna quickly introduce the uh, participants and uh, then I'm just gonna get things started. I'm excited to hear from all of them. Um, first off, I'm gonna introduce Merve Emre. Um, Merve is the author of Paraliterary the Making of Bad Readers in Post-War America, The Ferrante Letters, and The Personality Brokers, The Strange History of Myers-Briggs, and The Birth of Personality Testing. Um, her writing has appeared in Harper's Magazine, The New York Review of Books, Book Forum, um, and The New Yorker, among other places. Uh, she is a professor at the University of Oxford and is currently a fellow at the Wissenschaft Kolleg in Berlin, which means, yeah, sorry, um, which means that it's 1.10 a.m. her time. Um, Jane Hu is a writer and uh, a PhD candidate at the University of California, Berkeley. Her writing has appeared in Book Forum, The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Nation, The Ringer, and other publications. Um, Christian Lorenzen is a critic who lives in Brooklyn. He's a former editor at the London Review of Books, Harper's Magazine, The New York Observer, and The New Leader. And um, that brings me to my questions, but I, I see that Christian isn't online just yet, so. Star, all right, here we go. Hello, <laughs> here I am. Excellent. Hi, Christian. Hello. Um, I just introduced you. So uh, I don't know if you're ready to get started, but um, well, we're going to get started. Um, and I wanted to, to um, sort of start things off, Christian, uh, or, or so, sorry, Karan, I didn't get to you yet. I was just so nervous about Christian not being there. <laughs> Uh, Karan Mahajan is a novelist who grew up in New Delhi, uh, India, and moved to the U.S. for college. He is the author of the novels Family Planning and The Association of Small Bombs, which is a finalist for the 2016 National Book Award. Um, his writing has appeared in the New York Times, Vanity Fair, Book Forum, The New Republic, among other places, and he is currently a professor in the MF MFA program at Brown University. Um, Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. And uh, sorry about that hiccup. Um, Christian, I, I wanted to start off uh, asking you a question just because this, this, uh, the idea for this panel sort of originated with your piece. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll move um, away from that as, a, as the conversation goes on. But one of the things that was really interesting to me is, is um, just the second line of your review, after you say that careerism is the dominant style in American literature, you go on to say that that, that statement is neither um, a judgment nor a slur. And I thought that that was interesting because it, I, I think it used to be, still is the case that um, when you accuse an artist of careerism, there's sort of a, there's a implication that there's um, but that artist is selling out in some way. And I, I like the fact that you sort of, sort of diffuse that right off the bat. Um, and I feel like your piece argues more that careerism is an in inevitability at this point. And I'm wondering if you could sort of expand on that 
on how we got to this era of you know what you call careerism and particularly in terms of philip roth um i suppose i could have uh you know another thing i might have said is that careerism has become the dominant style of american life or at least certain parts of american life um i think a few readers of the piece seem to be confused about um whether I liked Roth or not. And of course I love a lot of his books, otherwise I wouldn't have bothered to write about him. But um, in this, so I, so just to state what I meant in a, in a clearer way, um, Roth's career began in the late 1950s at the onset of a new type of um, professionalization in American life. Um, this has been the subject of many works of sociology and <clears throat> fictions like The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, lots of writing about the new class, Chris for Lashes, The Culture of Narcissism once we get to the 1970s, and we all know it in the figure of the yuppie, um, which the young Roth and his alter egos, especially Portnoy, uh, pre-configure. Um, of course, writers have always engaged in self-promotion. Uh, Walt Whitman wrote and placed his own reviews of uh, Leaves of Grass. Um, but in the post-war era, image management has become necessarily more refined and part of the job, largely because of uh, technological revolutions, first television, the mass media in general, and now the internet. Um, <clears throat> all of these phenomena were hardly confined to writing and publishing, and Roth's fiction from Goodbye Columbus onward dramatizes this process of class ascent for his generation, whether his characters are writers, professors, artists, public officials, or uh, doctors or puppeteers. Um, now, because Roth was writing about the private side of these lives, the parts that have to do with sex and betrayal, he always had to insist that he was not the pervert some of his characters were. And the new biography shows that, uh, shows as much of him in the bedroom as it does at his standing desk, which he always insisted on uh, mentioning when interviewed about his writing process. But of course, if he were to be fully identified with um, Mickey Sabbath, or Portnoy, it would have been ruinous for him. He was already the subject of, of jokes being told on The Tonight Show. Uh, the one famous actress said she read his book, but she wouldn't want to shake his hand. Um, and so projecting the, the uh, image of the professional was crucial to keep him in the game and uh, and the object of prestige and a permanent candidate for the Nobel Prize in Literature, which of course he never got. So this is the world that we all have now. And uh, all writers have to engage in this. And if they want to survive, follow the journey that Roth took from outsider to the mainstream and meticulously manage their images along the way. This also creeps into the writing of fiction itself, I would argue. Anyway. Thanks, Christian. Um, Marve, I, I, I wanted to see if you wanted to follow up on that a little bit. Um, just because I know that you've done a lot of work uh, on post-war fiction and, and pedagogy. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering if you if you can sort of comment on the the ways that this idea of selling out or careerism might manifest in terms of different eras. Uh, for instance, is a is there a continuum there? Is there do you think it's manif that it's that there's a break in the continuum? Did selling out in the 50s or 60s look 
does it look different? I mean, of course it looks different from what it does now, but I'm just wondering if you could, you know, shed some light on that. Well, I, I think I would start by saying that as I was listening to Christian speak, I was wondering if there's actually an important difference between careerism and professionalism. Yeah. And the reason I was thinking this was in part because earlier this evening, I was reading Roth writing about Bello in The New Yorker in 2000. Um, and he's writing in particular about the adventures of Augie March. And he has this kind of wonderful reading of one of the last lines of Augie March. And it's the line where Augie March says, I'm good and tired of all these big personalities, destiny molders and heavy water brains, Machiavellis and wizard evildoers, big wheels and imposers upon absolutes. And the sort of joke for Roth about this line is that the whole freewheeling style of the adventures of Augie March is precisely the expression of this sort of large and robust ego that is you know, steamrolling everything in its way in order to make itself in America. And so he has this sort of interesting reading of Bellow as I think what Christian might call a careerist. But he immediately then sort of juxtaposes that with Bellow's exclusion from a whole bunch of different professional institutions. So immediately after that, he writes, Bello once told me that somewhere in my Jewish and immigrant blood, there were conspicuous traces of doubt as to whether I had the right to practice the writer's trade. He suggested that, at least in part, this doubt permeated his blood because our own WASP establishment, represented mainly by Harvard-trained professors, considered a son of immigrant Jews unfit to write books in English. And so one of the things that's really interesting to me about Roth writing about Bello and writing about Bello's careerism, perhaps as a projection of what Christian identifies as his own careerism, is that it's actually an answer to being excluded from a set of professional institutions that don't let you practice the trade of the writer. And so that's one thing that I thought could possibly account for the second line of Christian's review, where he is kind of recuperating or rescuing careerism from mere accusation or um, something purely pejorative by saying like, actually some people need to be careerists. They need to commit to the kind of individualism of careerism precisely because they can't uh, access professional belonging in the same kinds of ways. And so I maybe just wanted to start by thinking about whether or not there is that kind of important distinction between you know, institutional jockeying as the expression of professionalism and careerism on the other hand. And I can say more about you know, like how accusations of careerism have actually been going on for a really long time from you know, Henry James, T.S. Eliot, Fitzgerald. And then you know, I think in some ways the person who is Roth's biggest predecessor in, um, in terms of being accused of careerism is Sylvia Plath. And so there is a kind of long history of accusations of careerism um, that, that um, align themselves, I think, with writers uh, trying to reach larger publics, particularly through things like magazine writing that affixes itself to writers that, that come before Roth. But so those are just two really quick thoughts on how we might want to think about careerism. That's really interesting. And Merve, just like going back to this, uh, this distinction between Sylvia Plath and Philip Roth, I mean, how do you think that gender plays out in these discussions of careerism? Well, I mean, I was, I was doing a kind of Google engram of careerism earlier tonight just to see what the kind of trend was and how the word actually gets used. And it's interesting that like after the 60s and 70s, it often attaches itself to women. And so careerist women are a sort of recognizably ambitious type of woman in the, in the workplace. Um, I think with Plath at least, I mean, one of the reasons she gets accused of careerism, particularly by people who read her diaries and her letters after those have been published, is because she is so canny about how she wants her life as a writer to go forward. And so, you know, nearly every page of the diaries, for instance, is filled with plans, how she's going to secure a Fulbright, which articles she's going to submit to which magazines. And there's that sense of, I think, actually like having to work very hard in order to be a writer that often gets alighted with careerism, particularly for women or for 
writers who feel like, you know, like as Bellow says, who feel like they don't have access to the kinds of professional connections or institutions that would make becoming a writer much easier. Yeah, right, thanks. Um, Karan, just because you're a practicing novelist, I wanted to ask you about your, your own experience as a writer and, and, and um, if you, I mean, one way to ask this is just, did you identify with what Christian was talking about in his piece? Or maybe more particularly just, you know, what are some of the, uh, the pressures of careerism that you face as you are writing or publishing a book or working with uh, writers in training at, at, in the MFA system? Well, you know, I, I had the same thought that uh, Morve had actually about careerism versus professionalism, which I think is a great uh, distinction. Um, in the sense that uh, careerism implies that you're being led into some kind of falsity, perhaps, uh, in the pursuit of fame or power in, in the realm of literature, right? And um, the distinction that sprang to my mind when I read Christian's piece was actually um, Philip Roth versus uh, Don DeLillo, if you want to look at two sort of white male novelists from that period. And um, you have someone like DeLillo who is very much a professional novelist, right? He does this one thing and there's a clear progression and an arc, but sort of an, an eccentricities along the way. Um, and whereas with Roth, uh, you get the sense that Yes, while there is a sort of like range of work, um, as Christian points out, there's a lot of stage management uh, of how he's perceived in the public. Um, you know, I'll give you an example of this, which, which really is just virtue signaling, which even Roth is guilty of towards the end, where he does this interview, I think, in 2018 in the New York Times, where, you know, he's, he's great. He's reading a lot of uh, books by people of color and, and books about slavery. And, um, you know, uh, I remember talking to a friend of uh, Philip Roth's and saying, well, this is great that he's having, he's, he's sort of immersing himself in this stuff. And she said, I, I know how many pages he's read of those books. He's read about 10 pages of those books. So um, there's something about an 80 or 85 year old man at that point doing it that um, certainly is disheartening. And it's impossible to believe at that stage that some of that has not eaten into the actual work itself. I think there is a sense, of course, in which he's very aware of the sort of Dostoevskyan impulses underlying all of this, the kind of like irrationality of his own motives. But um, it does make one wonder if like certain, I think fairly boring books like American Pastoral uh, would have been supplanted by something uh, more interesting uh, had he been willing to use his sort of immense power to take more risks. So that's, that's just one thought of the, of the top of my head. I can get back to my own experiences too in a minute, but I, I wanna let others speak too. Yeah, well, maybe um, just, to, just to sort of go back to what Christian was talking about, about careerism sort of seeping into everything. Jane, um, you have a, an amazing piece in this issue about Edward Said. And um, I'm just wondering if you could sort of comment on this from a slightly different angle, from the angle of academia. And you can comment on this much better than I can, but like one of the things that I really loved about your piece is, is the way that you sort of presented Said is, is sort of selecting things from different, he wasn't just an academic, he was able to select, um, you know, he learned how to work with the media, he learned, he, he borrowed from his, um, he was a European, but he wasn't a European, you know, like he was, he was part of a tradition, but outside of a tradition. And um, I'm just wondering if you could comment on that and how he sort of used that uh, to, to become the sort of cultural figure that he was. So, oh, um, no, that's really helpful. And sort of the odd thing about, and again, I, I haven't read, I've only read Plot Against America and I haven't read uh, the, the, the biography. So I'm very untutored in Roth, um, but just sort of based on the reviews that I've read of the biography, it seems like Said's an interesting counterexample, not only because he's not really a novelist, right? So, so the kind of, um, 
uh, tension between uh, the writer's actual, you know, ideological beliefs or, you know, sexist, you know, whatever ethos um, doesn't necessarily get read into um, the writing the same way that it might for Roth. And, and as Christian said, um, the difference for Roth, the distance is crucial, right? To maintain an air of professionalism. For Said, I felt like um, at least, you know, in this very amazing, very, um, I think, reparative um, reading, which is also kind of, you know, I was sort of thinking about how they're both, both of the reviews are about biographies that try to speak on behalf. Um, and I think, you know, I, the, the sense I get from the Bailey is that it's generous, it might backfire regardless, but it, it, is, it is a generous um, reading by perhaps Roth's own design. Um, there is a kind of yeah, attempt to sort of extend what Said himself could not say or perhaps could not even see um, in the moments of his life um, as he's sort of moving through his canon. So to think about Saidian's like sort of Said celebrity status as an academic at the time, obviously is around sort of um, a lot of the controversial uh, political beliefs that he had at a sort of, um, sort of a, a, you know, a global scale. So. I, I almost want to say that Said is kind of this, ends up being a careerist despite himself. Like it's kind of the accretion of, of provocation and contradiction over a course of what feels, at least for me, um, reading the biography and reading the work over a large period of time feels unplanned as it's going, right? So, I mean, this would, this would be a, you know, I don't know if anyone has the answer, but this would be sort of my question for Roth is sort of, how much of it is a kind of after effect that we can only see now from the biography from a distance? Um, and how much of it is this kind of um, self-management that is intentional, um, sort of the way that Murphy's talking about, like, you know, I, I think of also um, not just Platt's diaries, but Sontag's, right? Where you sort of see this intense <laughs> overworked ambition of the, of the careerist woman who's like trying to make her way into, um, a literary sphere, a public literary sphere, right? Um, and that's that's where you sort of read the negative, um, yeah, um, yeah, the negative overtones of what a careerist is. So yeah, I, I do agree with Paran too that there's this sense that to be a careerist is to be impure, <laughs> um, or to sort of uh, have a gimmick to, you know, get ahead, right? Um, for or fame or or the ends are sort of more important than the means. I, I really do feel like. Said himself was kind of learning media, learning how to um, simplify, sometimes provocatively, really complicated um, sort of, you know, yeah, global geopolitical events that were happening in real time. He, he was really like an expert at sort of packaging, um, but I, I, I feel like it was sort of, yeah, a, a, an urgent kind of packaging that it, that it wasn't, it, it doesn't read cynically to me even after the fact. Can I jump in there because Jane's, can I jump in, is that okay? Please, please. Yeah, because Jane's comment made me think about two things. I mean, the first is this question of how much uh, part of what's involved in kind of retro projecting Roth as a careerist is that he's being written about at this particular moment when something called auto fiction appears to be ascending. And it is tempting, right, to read his career as moving toward autofiction as its telos. And I was just wondering today, like had he died 10 years earlier or 15 years earlier, had he died when we were still in the world of, you know, like Paul Auster's metafiction, would we make the same kind of argument or would we be able to see the same kind of arc? And then the second thing that Jane made me think of, the point about packaging, um, I think is really, really important because when you look at you know, earlier in the 20th century, the accusations of careerism that are lobbed against people like T.S. Eliot or even Henry James or uh, Fitzgerald, you know, it's all about the fact that they are circulating these short stories, these kind of packaged stories in places like Harper's or the Saturday Evening Post or Plath writing her short stories for Mademoiselle. And I think that idea of packaging and everything it implies that it's a different kind of genre than say the novel, um, that it's a different, that it works according to a different kind of pattern of circulation 
um, that it is capable of, of drawing these large crowds and that the publication of a short story can be an event. I mean, I think all of that feeds into those accusations of careerism and makes you know, the, the novel and the writing of novels appear like a kind of rarefied realm that should be purified of those kinds of, um, of, those kinds of pressures. Actually, I wanna, I wanna jump in just to relate sort of my experiences to what Morve talked about, which is that you know, there are certain parts of being a professional novelist that um, I actually enjoy, right? Like if I would even call myself that, which is like the interviews, you spent five or six years like in agony, in silence, <laughs> working on a book, and then it's gonna come out and someone wants to interview you, you know it's a chance of like, sort of like, you know, even self, sort of self mythologizing, setting the tone of the conversation, things that we've enjoyed in other writers. And I actually think that auto fiction in some ways is just authors recognizing that we like author interviews a lot more than the novels and just sort of doubling down on them until they turn into entire books. A lot of Philip Roth's books are just interviews for themselves, I think. Um, that's what they are, in a, a, you know, if you were looking at them deeply. Um, but the part of it that, you know, that Morve is talking about short stories. For me, the, the equivalent when I was publishing my second novel, which again, I published after an eight year gap, um, was the personal essay. Like there was this immense pressure to produce a personal essay of some kind. Um, and it kept coming at me from, you know, uh, from my agent and editor in a sort of soft way, but also publications mostly would kind of approach you and say, can you relate your experiences to this? And there was a certain point at which I sat down and wrote a personal essay and handed it into an editor and then withdrew it at the very last minute and did it again with the editor and withdrew it again. And I think it was entirely because I had no desire to write it. I'd given in to sort of the demands of the machine, which wanted this sort of pound of flesh from me, for me to bear like my, my writer's nipple or whatever you want to call it, um, to titillate the audience a little bit. And, um, you know, that, I think is something that a lot of novelists succumb to. And once you succumb to it, then you become part of this wheel of producing more and more work like that, right? And at that point you are being dominated and controlled by a kind of external narrative. So, so I think that um, is something I've become very wary of, which is like being very careful in that interregnum between books about what I actually work on versus what is you know, something demanded by someone else. Mm -hmm. Karan, I have a question there. Do you have a sense of how much those demands for um, extracting the um, metaphysical pound of flesh in the form of the personal essay, how much of that did you feel was sort of um, oriented around um, race, uh, to put it bluntly? Because sort of something that I've been thinking about, and I, I, of course it's there um, already sort of, you know, and Christian, you mentioned this in, in the sort of um, relationship of the sort of Jewish um, Afro analogies earlier on in Roth's career, right? But there, I mean, something that I've been thinking about a lot around autofiction um, and especially the assumption that it's largely this um, universal or this white genre, right? Is that Taolin is an excellent example of um, perhaps like one of uh, our greatest Asian Americanist careerists, right? if we define it as someone who can kind of travel um, between scandal and um, and and sort of an uh, sort of auto fictional yeah narrative um, but you know just sort of thinking much more I mean, into sort of the history of ethnic American writing right there's this um, assumption oftentimes that the novels even the fiction can be read through um, a personal eye whether that's true or not so um, I mean that's just sort of something else that was sort of bubbling up for me Christian you mentioned Toni Morrison as um, I think a woman activist of letters and like that you know towards the end of her life perhaps but you know when she first I was, fiction is I that... was actually thinking of her her work as an editor at Random House oh okay when I said that and I, I was I was trying to draw a contrast between like her and William Dean Howells as a patrician uh, man of letters. Um, I, th little things I was doing like that were perhaps lost in the, you know, in all, in all my jokes about Nabokov and stuff like that. Um, if I could respond to a couple of things, um, <clears throat> Karin, it, it, uh, it strikes me that the, the request for a personal essay 
from a novelist with a book coming out has basically been formal. It's basically a formalization of mailers advertisements for myself. Um, uh, as f and then in terms of Except the question Christian, of Christian, I would interrupt. Except for the fact that Mailer uh, was willing to make himself seem like a bad guy and to go out on a limb. The personal essay oh, yeah, now of is, course about, there was... is about seeming like a nice guy uh, while writing about whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. Of course, there was a lot more like irony and performative transgression uh, going on with Mailer in addition to his actual criminal behavior. Um, then on the question of selling out and also uh, and also the Jane's question of whether <clears throat> what we're looking at, what we're, what we're doing here is engaging in a, in um, a projection of after effects. Uh, Roth was accused of being a careerist from the beginning of his career, especially at the time of Portnoy's complaint by uh, Norman Potteritz who himself had written the memoir, Making It, by um, Irving Howe uh, and many others. And also was from the start accused of, uh, of selling out his own uh, Jewish American milieu. Um, and in contrast to Bello, Roth belonged to a generation or kind of micro generation after Bellow among the New York intellectuals where the barriers that Bellow had faced where like, I guess the good example would be that Lionel Trilling was the only Jewish um, member of the faculty in the English department at Columbia, but that all of those barriers were starting to fall down by the sixties. Um, Roth himself, in those late interviews uh, over the last 10 years or so of his life was constantly at pains to, to um, prescribe the label for himself as an American writer rather than a Jewish American writer and would, would say that his real precursors were like John Dos Passos. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the arc of his actual literary production, it follows a path of looking for new models constantly. So Bailey argues, I think correctly, that there's a bit of Fitzgerald in The Great Gatsby in Goodbye Columbus. Then he moves to imitating Henry James. Then he reads in Letting Go and When She Was Good. Then he is, he's been, he's read in reviews by Alfred Kazin that he's neglected his gifts for comedy. So he writes Portnoy's Complaint. Then he writes uh, three satirical novels, uh, one of which is the Kafka-esque The Breast, the great American novel, which is kind of a mess and a disaster in many ways and overindulgent in his comedy. And he tacks back into um, the more uh, autobiography and autobiographical me metafiction of uh, the Zuckerman books. Um, and particularly Zuckerman Bound is his, that's if we're looking for Philip Roth as autofiction, there we have Zuckerman has, is dealing with the success that he uh, and scandal he had after writing a book called Karnofsky, which stands in for Portnoy's complaint. Um, not sure, quite sure where I'm going here, but to pick up on Karn's point about uh, DeLillo, I've always, I've never quite been clear with DeLillo on exactly how popular and widely read he was during the 1970s. So in the first decade and a half of his career. Um, I know that Endzone was excerpted in both Sports Illustrated and The New Yorker, but DeLillo doesn't really make it big until he wins the National Book Award for White Noise. And he's already been a recluse. There's a famous story uh, when a um, scholar and 
and a novelist comes finds him in Athens and approaches him wanting to do an interview and DeLillo gives him a card that says I'd rather not talk about it. Um, so DeLillo was kind of already a mystery by the time he came to the public eye whereas Roth was just a 20 something phenom. Um, and uh, had to make decisions about how to f handle fame at an earlier stage. It's interesting, Cynthia Ozick has a piece on Roth in the Times Book Review where he said, where, where she says that, uh, I forget the line exactly, fame suited him, you can't imagine him without it, something like that. That's not, that's not the line, but that's the implication. Can I, um, can I jump in just with a yeah. question? So I, I've just been reading the chat and seeing some of the questions in there about maybe bringing a little bit more precision to the term careerism, if that's something we want to do. Um, but like, I, I mean, despite your, I think, very um, admirable attempts to recuperate it, Christian, I just keep coming back to the idea that like one of the things that careerism measures is some sort of distance between ambition and talent that like we call people careerist who I, uh, who seem to be always kind of jonesing for a kind of professional accomplishment, but don't seem to have the kind of raw talent for it. Um, or there's some sort of mismatch, right? Between what they claim to want and how they present themselves and the work that goes into that. And then what the actual product is and how people judge the actual product of their work. And I guess I'm wondering if that actually, like despite starting my comments by saying like, I think it can be recuperated for these reasons. Um, I actually do keep wondering if there's like really no way to rinse it of its pejorative edge. And if that's actually something good because one of the things that it makes us aware of is how um, being careerist today um, is a necessity, but it's a necessity because the market for creative labor is structured in such a way that what has to be saleable now are ourselves, which yeah. I think gets back to Karen and Jane's points about, about uh, personal essays and autobiography and inviting autobiographical readings as being part of the, the product that you are selling to an audience, right? That you're selling yourself now. I mean, I don't disagree with you there. Um, no, I didn't think you would. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't think you would. But I mean, you know, I, I think when I was initially thinking about what the distinction might be between being a careerist and being a professional, one thing I was thinking was that one becomes a careerist when being a professional is no longer available to you. Um, so when you no longer have the protections that a kind of guild, uh, a collectivity of people that are all doing the same kinds of work that you're doing and are doing it with some degree of solidarity, when that's no longer available to you, that's when the careerist mode becomes um, attractive. And you know, the reason everybody needs to be a careerist today is because um, the writer's trade is a completely, um, is a completely, uh, um, Obsian nightmare. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> thank well, you. Two, yes. Yeah. Two two responses to that. One, I it got me thinking when you used the word guild about academia, right, and writers and academia. Um, I started teaching at an MFA two years ago and had resisted it for a long time. And the end, the reason I ended up getting into academia, which was very lucky, of course, as you know, those jobs are so scarce, was health insurance, right? So there's a way in which. Um, I think there's a history to be written of how health insurance has uh, directed the fate of many creative artists. And there is a way in which academia, of course, turns one, uh, turns and changes certain priorities, I imagine. Like, you know, if you're a writer, reviewer, uh, not, or a novelist critic, um, you're probably not gonna be giving a negative review to the head of an MFA program that's gonna hire you, right? So, so the, for criticism, I think it gets blurrier there. Um, 
uh, it's not necessarily true for novelists, but there's also a way in which academia, uh, I know you, you teach as well, Merve, is about scorekeeping, right? You have to constantly come up with lists of things you've done, events you've gone to. And I can imagine, I, I've only been doing it for two years, but I do worry about uh, what kind of effect that scorekeeping will have on me. So, so that's just one part of, you know, how careerism and professionalism gets distorted by academia for novelists. Um, the other part I wanted to actually respond to Christian, I think that's a really good point that Roth was thrust into the limelight at 25. And also that his entire um, career, his entire sort of career as a, as a manager of his image is about his incredible fear of being canceled, right? Essentially, his is a career designed to stave off cancellation while writing stuff that will get you canceled. So uh, I, I understand and I almost sort of applaud Roth for continuing to write fairly transgressive things, um, right into, you know, off the Sabbath's theater. Um, I think that it would be good to actually, to see writers use that as a model now, which is to reproduce transgressive work and then to come out and sort of present themselves as, you know, relatable, nice people, right? Which is again, the Roth model. I'm just a nice professor. Um, but here, meanwhile, it's like really savage fiction about, you know, my sexual desires. So yeah, those just two, two thoughts that I had. But I wrote it at my standing desk in my monk-like existence. In exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, one Ross, quick question I wanted oh, to ask. To, oh, oh, sorry. No, please. I was just gonna do, uh, sorry, Michael, you should go. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it later. Well, I was I was just going to bring this to the present for a moment. And Christian, something that you referred to was the uh, the auto fiction is self flattery, and I, I did want to just we've been talking a lot about Roth, and I did want to bring this up to the present to some extent. And I have a few questions around this, and I don't want to jumble them all together. But um, you know, is there a is there an escape from what you consider careerism? Um, how does it manifest in, in uh, writing that we're reading that's coming out now? Uh, and um, how does it affect us as readers? You know, I, I, that's another question that I wanted to touch on um, before, we turn the, before we turn this over to the, uh, the questions from the audience. Well, it's, I was, I wrote, I've written several things about auto fiction in the past. And one time I uh, like, do you know the, the, that passage in the opening of The Catcher in the Rye where Holden Caulfield talks about reading a book and really just wanting to call the author up on the phone and ask him how he came up with all this stuff. Auto fiction to a certain extent um, invites uh, that sort of mentality from readers. Like it, it's, look at me, is this really me? And Roth was doing that, you know, especially during his novels of the late seventies and eighties, um, <clears throat> where you get multiple versions of Philip Roth in Operation Shylock and the, the counter life, especially. Um, I remember one time I was at a, uh, a reading Ben Lerner did in London and two young men just said like, do you really smoke weed? Like Adam Gordon in your book? It, it looked like they were uh, almost reading his books like self-help in a way, or, or maybe more like um, uh, books that could pardon them for their bad habits. Um, the, and then in terms of the auto fiction of self flattery, I've used that on a specific writer that I won't mention, people can Google it if they want. Uh, but do you, Max Reed wrote a great piece for Book Forum a couple of years ago about uh, James Frey, James Frey's novel, which he called um, auto fan fiction, I think was the term he used. Uh, so I, and obviously after Canals Guard's epic, My Struggle, 
you know, we've been saturated with this stuff. And I think if, if there's a way out of it, it will be through a backlash where we want different kinds of stories, different kinds of worlds in the fictional books that we read. And I, you know, if we were having this conversation 20 years ago, we'd probably be debating James Wood's arguments about his hysterical realism as the dominant style and that's gone but something like it could come back you know there's things percolating all over yeah my my two cents um argument about autofiction is always that um blankness um ambiguity inscrutability is something that can be stylized if you're not already sort of you know I mean, I'm just going to take Asian here, a person of color who's already kind of being projected um, with those stereotypes. Um, so, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why autofiction is is tends towards largely white authors. Um, it's how it's a, it's a way in which reading is informed, as you're saying, Michael. Right? Like, perhaps um, a lot of uh, writers of color are writing autofiction, but you know, there's a kind of presumption of how we read those subjectivities, right? So. Um, I mean, then that's another question of Roth, right? Like Roth getting to be a bad boy and getting away with it and, and it being titillating, right? It actually being good for his career to kind of walk that, you know, spicy line um, comes from a kind of, um, like he's working with more, like he has more resources there. Um, but to go sort of very quickly to what I really liked about what Merve said about work, like effort, right? Um, it does seem like careerism and Christian, I was like really interested in you calling careerism the new style of American letters or life contra realism <laughs> as, as a, um, so I you know those, that was a bit of a, that contrast was a bit of a joke no I, I know yeah. I know but it, I mean yeah. it's telling too right it's telling I, I mean you could I if I if I really tried I could probably make an argument to tie it to like uh, Mark Fisher's capitalist realism something like that you know no it makes like, sense I mean the kind of the, the inescapability, the suffusion of a kind of capitalist careerism, right? But like something that I was thinking about in terms of style, like both autofictional style as a kind of blank style, but also careerism as a kind of, um, let's just say here, not just all professional style, but a literary style, right? That has to come be expressed through language or has to be expressed through the form of the, of the literary production or the gossip or the paratext of the biography that surrounds it. Um, is careerism because it has to be read somehow as a material difference between labor, which is like more, and product or talent, um, which is you know maybe disproportionate to it. Does that mean that careerism, to be called careerism, contra professionalism, has to happen in the public sphere? Like, is is this something that actually has to manifest through something like social media networks, gossip? Like, you could be a uh, backstabbing careerist and no one can know like does, does then like yeah, that's, know, are we sir, kind of I'm sure reading? that's true it like it's in, in, yeah. in that well I mean like and then I mean I, I what I keep coming back to is that careerism isn't actually like a thing that we can point to right. in the world that it's an aesthetic judgment of yeah. people's performances of their labor yeah. right and, and that that judgment always has something at stake in it. Um, but it's not, it, what's at stake isn't necessarily the, what's at stake isn't necessarily um, what we think is at stake, right? Um, and I, I guess I think, I mean, I guess maybe I feel somewhat similarly about autofiction, which is that I'm not actually convinced that that's a like a, a robust genre category like when I start trying to think the differences between autofiction and metafiction, it kind of falls apart quite quickly. Um, and I wonder if there's some argument I wanna make that I can't quite put my finger on yet, but if there's some link between um, the kind of judgment that careerism invites, which is a judgment of, you know, you're working too hard and not producing sufficiently good product um, and autofiction, which is that you're kind of not working hard enough <laughs> by simply transmuting your own experiences into, into this novel. 
I mean, it seems to me like there's some kind of link there that I can't quite articulate now, but, but what you're saying about how labor structures both of these things seems to me to be key in relating the terms. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, it's ultimately a judgment about the self. It's about kind of subject um, and self-production that is, you know, is so informative to the novel, which is why, you know, like Said's a really interesting um, critical figure, but I, I really did like that we were sort of thinking that, that Christian, your essay was really thinking about the novelist, even though like, you know, one question that I do have, and maybe people in Q&A have this too, is like, how does it inform Roth's writing um, beyond uh, like the scandal, it seems about around women beyond the level of like content, like the kind of like does it does is is it like Dickensian careerism where you're just like writing as much as you possibly can up to the word count? Is it, it you know does it does it inform it in terms of just like how much he writes, um, or is it always sort of just about reading different kinds of identity formations or subject formations? One, one one answer to that might be so. The other thing I was reading this evening before we started talking was I was reading his exchange with Mary McCarthy, um, where uh, he sends her a copy of uh, the first Zuckerman novel. I think I can't remember exactly which one, and she responds to him telling him that she didn't like it, and she explains why. And she keeps confusing him with Zuckerman in her letter to him, explaining why she didn't like the novel. And he writes this really kind of congenial and wonderful letter back to her, where he like very patiently explains that he is, that he is not his character, right? And that, and I think one of the lines in there is that he says, he says, I'm working a lot harder than you think I'm working at this. Um, which I which I really really like because I think it again brings together those those concepts of you know either metafiction and autofiction along with careerism where he says I'm working hard and what I'm producing is better than you think it is and calling me a careerist is to ally both the work that I'm doing but also the quality of what it is that I've produced yeah I think it's Operation Shylock thank you whoever said that in the chat um, so like the judgment of careerism is both to say like the person is working too hard at the wrong things, right? They're working at self-promotion, they're working at institutional jockeying, and what they're producing isn't good enough for all of the work that they're doing on the stuff that isn't the novel. And for the novel, they're not doing enough work, they're just kind of, you know, vomiting their selfhood onto the page. Now I'm sort of thinking it's, I, and I'll stop after this, is that careerism, is it, is it, is it always an aesthetic judgment of the reader then? Like, um, is like the, the hardest working careerist one that we can't even call a careerist because they're doing the work so well in the liter literary text that like you can't even sort of read all of the layers? Anyway. Well, I guess, I guess the question would be whether, I, I think Jane, you had brought this up earlier maybe, is that whether we are much more tuned to careerism now because yeah there's the public space of the internet like yeah everyone was it was probably plenty of secret careerists i know that like mailer when he writes that essay about judgments and talent in the room he sort of accuses william styron of being just a guy who's like out to network with everyone win a lot of medals right and he does win a lot of prizes but he's not really a novelist we read now so like the judgment of time has sort of defeated the efforts of his careerism. So there's this thing about like, when you see someone operating on Twitter in a very careerist mode, um, if you are trying to make a serious literary career as opposed to sort of sell uh, 10,000 copies of your book in the first two weeks, um, then you, I think, judge that in a particular way as a misplaced label, right? Um, so, so that to me is like, I, I do think that this is much more in all of our minds because we see, yeah, authors kind of at this sort of constant party that is happening on Twitter, uh, peeling off into corners, speaking to each other. Um, and I, I don't, I think the, the way around it, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there is a way around it. I, I do think that one thing is to, is to always think of the medium that one is using and what it wants you to do. Um, and, and to play against that, right? So like, I like being on Twitter. I just try to use it for as much fun as I can. Um, uh, not that I haven't, I'm sure, used it to tweet other people's books or talk about my friends. And as opposed to use it as a purely capitalist uh, mode, which is what Twitter wants for self-propagation. Uh, I also think that there's a flip side uh, in terms of academia where 
it can be very freeing for certain writers from the forces of careerism. You know, the Brown MFA program where I am, I'm probably the most mainstream writer there. It's sort of known for experimental writing. John Hawks, Robert Coover, Angela Carter taught there for a while, you know. Um, and all these, uh, all these people have sort of been able to ignore market forces. Carol Meso teaches there now, um, precisely because they have uh, a salary that you know allows them to keep going. So it's not all bad. Can I just pull a comment in from the chat? Um, because somebody just said, um, you know, is the accusation of careerism the accusation an accusation that always comes from one's peers? Right, you don't see readers referring to writers as careerist, do you? Like it does seem like it's it's the you're you're always judged as careerist by a jury of of your own peers, aren't you? I mean, it's not the kind of accusation that just like a, a you know a reader who wasn't also a writer in some way would ever make. I think that was one right. of the questions that I had um, for you, Christian, in that. Um, there was a sense that at least, you know, you're sort of talking about Roth writing at, I think a different moment than Quran, you're talking about Twitter right now, right? Like that, like he's, he, you, you call him sort of the first and a kind of um, exemplary, e yeah, exemplary figure for contemporary careerism. But the way in which you write about the kind of literary scene and where like everyone knows everyone and everyone's in this book, like to think about, pure pyramid pure pure and shit like it is I, I don't know maybe there are there's a greater possibility of readers to call out careers and now that there's kind of I wouldn't call it democratization but I feel like they're the 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 boundaries of like what the in versus out crowd of like who you and maybe academia is a little bit different but like has that changed from Roth's time or are we all still sort of like myopically functioning in the same um networks well, I mean, it, it's Twitter sort of makes that Holden Caulfield dream of calling up your favorite author very possible. You know, you can just get on there and say, hey, and, you know, you might may or may not get an answer and everybody's going to know that you asked. Or at least some people might. Um, I think that, uh, well, one thing I was, one contrast I was, trying to make and maybe I, it was just in my imagination for Roth was between Roth projecting this I'm a pure monk of writing at my desk um, and he didn't really you know we knew he was a baseball fan but we didn't there was no nothing more about his persona than that, really, at least in the way he tried to project it, as opposed to like another writer who did a lot of interviews after he became famous, Nabokov, who's constantly talking about like hunting for butterflies and stuff. And so a, a, um, <clears throat> a kind of a, a very successful, but at the same time train wreck of a careerist in American letters who comes after Roth and with the publication of his last novel, got a got a blurb from Roth and declared himself an acolyte of Roth, which he had never done before because previously he had been the acolyte of DeLillo or Paula Fox or Alice Munro or Haruki Murakami is Jonathan Franzen, who also will perform his Nabokov, I'm a, I'm a uh, lover of fauna, except instead of butterflies, it's birds. Um, and but is also notoriously a eater of his own shoe whenever he gives an interview or whenever he becomes like a self-destructive uh, internet meme. Yet the last profile we had of him is uh, Franzen as failed television writer in the New York Times at the time of the publication of his last essay collection. Um, so that's a model of paradoxically successful failed careerism, I would say, in the in the present moment. Well, you know, um, one, one thing about sorry, Michael, I'll let you I'll let you go in case you're trying to stop us or something like that. No, no, please go and then I'll go. 
No, I, uh, Pattinson is a, is, is a interesting example because I think of the work as being careerist in a strange way. I don't, I actually like the corrections when it came out, but when I try rereading it now, it is interesting with a gap of about 10, 15 years, how my mind has changed. And it, there is a kind of like way in which this is a person who's looking at the universe of, of famous white writers around him and saying, how can I sort of plot out a mean path between these writers and make it mainstream? And it's funny, I can really see it now and it, it's on the level of, the st of style and of, of the sentence at times. Um, the sentences kind of lack personality, I think. And sometimes that's my problem with Roth as well, is that uh, I, you know, I'm not always convinced, and maybe this is sort of off topic, that he's a writer who lost uh, just because there's something about the style itself, the sentences, that are the perfect average American sentence, right? There isn't, Bellow has a kind of like vivacity and weirdness, uh, vivaciousness and weirdness and like same with Nabokov, um, same with Toni Morrison. Uh, I'm just thinking of people whose sentences are strange. Roth is, is, a, is a careerist on the level of the, the average American sentence. Yeah, he, the, I think the main, going back to Roth this time around, the main, quality of his prose is fluency and yeah. at times it even be to the point of almost like an invisible style when he's not doing outright comedy can i just zoom us out for a second because something someone said in the chat made me think I, I can't remember who said it in the chat but they said it's much easier to sell a book if you're a celebrity in another field first like, aren't the real careerists, the politicians that are selling their memoirs right now, and like the, you know, the models that are selling their personal essay collections, and the celebrities, the pop stars that are selling their stories of how they became as famous as they are, like, isn't, isn't in some ways the real careerism, the narration of one's career and the, like, insertion of that narration into a literary form from another field. Yeah, like, I mean, I was- I just really zoomed out here and just thought about all the other genres that are kind of available to us that might actually be better or like tighter manifestations of careerism than, than the novel, whether autofictional or metafictional or whatever. I, just to, a couple of years ago, or maybe it must've been five years ago because I was still living in London. I was at a dinner party with people who worked in a kind of more commercial end of publishing and they said the biggest like growth market or for authors that they were kind of recruiting to write books was youtubers right. some of them teenagers right. but for those people like uh writing a book is an opportunistic garland on a on a career mm -hmm. that takes place in you know multiple media but isn't that the purest expression of careerism? Like, shouldn't that, well, like, yeah. isn't that in some ways yeah. like the, the kind of apotheosis of careerist thinking? It would be if you were thinking about um, per, like careerist as life, right? I, I do think that like the idea that the telos of the literary, at least Roth as an example, of the literary fiction writer is getting the Nobel Prize. Like I do, I do think kind of thinking about professional steps that are kind of built into what one thinks of as a career arc. Um, yeah, what does it mean that now anyone can write a book or anyone can get someone to ghostwrite their book or, you know, so, someone can ghostwrite their own um, biography even after death. So I think it's about like, do we, what, what is the status of, of, of literary fiction, I guess, it, which is also something that is about, you know, is, is about purity in, in a lot of these, in these mm. debates. Right. I mean, yeah, I think it's, it's super interesting with literary fiction only because, yeah, as you said, we think of it as a model of integrity, uh, the writer alone in his or her or their room working on something. And to find that sullied, you know, perhaps is not surprising. There's something obviously a little childish about all of us that we think that that matters, right? Um, but the question I have for the three of you uh, is, I was trying to think of counterfactuals. One is like, who is an actual super careerist novelist whose work we read now, like someone who we can identify as 
you know, going towards market trends and doing it in an okay way? And who is someone who became super careerist and had their career actually damaged by it? I was just trying to think of, of counter, like of examples. And it's, it's, it's funny, I'm, I'm, it's hard for me to come up with them on the spot, but. Well, I would think of a damaged sellout would be John O'Hara, who started writing these bloated books after the 20s that were meant to be, I, I guess his great ex, ex success came in the 30s, like Appointment with Samara. But his big break from the New Yorker occurred when he was writing these really kind of bloated, kitschy novels that were meant to be uh, adapted on Broadway. And the New York, like, um, what's his name? The guy who wrote Here at the New Yorker one of those names kind of somewhat lost to time, wrote a hit piece on one of those novels and O'Hara was like, I'll never send the New Yorker another story. And he had been one of their you know, main guys in the early years. And I think eventually he made up with William Sean and gave him the trilogy Sermons in Soda Water. But um, there's a guy who, for whom selling out definitely had bad consequences in, for posterity. I mean, we return to him now and again, but uh, I would imagine many in our audience have maybe never heard of him or and certainly never read him. I used to, I got hooked on him from finding nice old editions in the Strand when I was in my twenties. So I'm just going to jump in here really fast. Everyone, this it's great to it's been amazing to um, listen to this conversation. I do want to give the audience a chance to ask a few questions. Um, I have a few that uh, I'm going to ask now. Um, and the first one is from Lynn Tillman. Um, her question is, how does ambition play in a discussion of careerism? How does one draw boundaries? To say a writer is ambitious, who can be ambitious without taint? An ambitious woman, an ambitious man, such different images. That's her comment. And I, I just wanted to pass that along to the panelists. Hmm. Well, I, it's like, it's an unseemly ambition to write the great American novel, right? That is, that has aged badly. Like, again, I'm thinking of Franz and you read the corrections and you're, you're, sh I'm, sh you're, one is shocked that there's not, is there not one person of color who appears in it, right? Like, uh, again, it's not to say that there can't be a good book without a person of color in it, but you can see the definition of the great American novel that he was operating on was kind of narrow. So I think like a, a definition set by some kind of external validating culture like America or like the Academy, um, that ambition seems more tainted to me than the ambition to write like a wild 600 page book or something. I mean, I think Lynn is totally correct that ambition attaches very differently to subjects based on gender. That seems right. like, you know, completely, uh, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's right. And I think it goes back to, you know, the comment that Jane made about um, how one judges a person who works hard and seems to work hard in the absence of appropriate compensation for working as hard as they do. Um, you know, one term of judgment might be ambitious, another might be careerist, another might be a dupe, and a fourth might be just stupid and hopeless, right? Um, and so I think all of those, you know, all of those terms, um, like I said before, are, you know, measuring different things. And I think what they're measuring is obviously very different based on gender. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I guess I would take one opportunity to, if there is a, I think the best novelist operating in a semi-Rothian mode, at least some of the time, and very clearly ambitious writer is Sheila Hetty, who's, and if you look at how should a person be in particular, you can, there's, you know, the influence of Roth and is all over it and the and the and the boundaries of transgression had shifted um i'm not gonna i could quote the book from memory but i, I won't um so i think uh 
I guess I would say that new horizons are opening up in terms of who's allowed to be ambitious, but certainly it's shifted over time. Yeah, it's sort of about the like um, relative density of that representative type already in the in mm -hmm. the guild, right? So mm -hmm. it's it's also the unlikelihood. Like you're ambitious if you if you if you want something that that is unlikely to happen. I keep thinking of um, uh, Catherine Gallagher's amazing book on um, 18th century women writers, nobody's story, and it's about the vanishing act of certain women writers in the 18th century into um, the marketplace, precisely because not representing themselves is a more effective means of getting their, their literature out, right? So again, sort of this, this um, the, the woman question, right? The woman writer question is as old as, you know, the novel form itself. I mean, George Eliot was accused of being careerist for using a pseudonym to publish, right? I mean, that, <laughs> I think that gets yeah. right to the heart of like how, how, how minimal effort in fact is needed as a woman to be labeled careerist, right? All you do is change your name and publish under a different name. And all of a sudden you're a careerist. Can I, can I give a quick uh, count? I just, I just thought of, again, slightly related of someone who has not been careerist at all, who has actually, as a result, uh, fallen out of a kind of canon is, uh, until recently at least, is Arundhati Roy, The God of Small Things. It's a book I teach and I think is, unbelievable, probably, I think the, the sort of a perfect novel from India in many ways. Um, but she vanished for 25 years doing other things and was not in the professional sphere. And she doesn't appear on lists of like people who are the best prose writers now, people who are, you know, and, and she, was, she was kind of then um, taken to task for becoming this kind of activist and not hewing to the paths that had been laid out for her by the Booker Prize. Um, so yeah, I, was just, I just was thinking of that too, as like who is allowed to kind of drop in and drop out and like what you need to continue doing for your book to be on the radar of um, sort of other literary professionals, if not readers. The next question comes <clears throat> from Jerry Howard. Uh, he said, Sontag and Roth make a perfect compare and contrast pair. I hope the panelists might tease out the contrasts and comparisons. Mark Greif wrote a great essay about that for the LRB once, or at least the beginning. I think it was a, his review of uh, the first volume of Sontag's notebooks, comparing basically as talking about Sontag and Roth as the, the last two, uh, important generation of the New York intellectuals. I mean, with Sontag, it, it, genre becomes a big question, right? Because she always wanted to be known as a novelist, but her most successful, which became famous as a critic, right? And as a social commentator and a theorist of uh, culture. But to the end, you know, uh, came back and won the National Book Award in the 90s for one of her historical novels, which was a very different in style from the experimental Barthelme-esque stuff she was writing in the 60s. Uh, so I guess what I would say was, was Roth was lucky in that his, his, his talent aligned with the, tempta the careerist temptations he wanted to pursue, whereas uh, Sontag's ambitions, talent, and the opportunities available to her were kind of uh, non-congruent, let's say. They didn't always match, and so she didn't always get what she wanted out of her career, I mean, while one, still becoming, having a great one. one. One point of comparison might be Sontag hiding or renouncing her lesbianism, and Roth renouncing his identity as a specifically Jewish writer, right? I mean, I think that that's a really interesting point of comparison that like in order to make themselves appealing to a larger kind of public that they're actually rinsing themselves of these kinds of identity markers. Interestingly though with Roth as 
Ozick says in her review this weekend, she renounced that identity as a label, but it he never took the Jews out of his books. Far from right. it. I mean, you know, and I and I think that that I think that that's one of the key distinctions, right? I mean, like you don't have to renounce it. You know, Sontag didn't renounce it in in life either. Yeah. Um, and it certainly is in the fiction as well. Um, but she certain she didn't want to be known as a lesbian. Okay, the I mean, next this, this gets back to Jane's point and Karen's point from earlier about like what it means to be a particularly kind of unmarked subject and how that allows more people to a larger public to attach to you um, if you do appear sort of um, blank and like easily available for your readers or your audience's projection. Okay, the next question comes from Andrea Balzano. What does what distinguishes careerism from wanting to be read? Well, I guess I would say that like everybody wants to be read or at least wants to be read by a certain audience. In talking about careerism, I'm talking about a whole system that involves the publishing industry, the MFA industry, the prize system, media, uh, you know, the Nobel Prize, like these are not things that Philip Roth didn't think about because he was in there right from the start. And, you know, what critics are going to say to you, how can you control what's said about you, uh, engaging in feuds with Christopher Lehmanhoff of the New York Times in the in, the uh, New York Review of Books letters pages, like I don't think those uh, those kind of meta battles really increased Roth's readership. Um, what got him the huge readership was identifying a revolutionary moment in the culture where confessional literature about sex was suddenly a new possibility because Lady Chatterley's lover wasn't banned anymore. Yeah, it seems like the, it's the direction of um, desire, right? Like, or how desire gets projected. Like, I, I assume everyone who writes wants to get read, but I, I feel like that that is kind of immeasurable, whereas it does seem like careerism comes from without like perhaps it is strategized but I, I'm sure people get called careers to kind of stumble their way into fame um or or, or more so than other sort of active careerists so but it, but yeah I, I think it does seem increasingly true and I think this like correct me if I'm wrong but I feel like this is one of the implications of your um essay Christian that increasingly one um one must get these public um, accolades in order to be read, that like the great unread um, perhaps grows wider. You know, I, I'm not sure, like, you know, I, I can barely keep up with all the things that are getting awards right now. So yeah. I do wonder if that's, that's, the, that's the careerist move um, that perhaps may seem crass from outside, but it's actually um, can be kind of like this, yeah, melancholic, um, you know, you know uh, effort that one must make simply to be in be read right right and that was wasn't there that piece recently uh, about how this is much more pronounced in the world of poetry that that you know five or six poets have been on each other's prize committees and have awarded each other about a million dollars in prize money but also poetry is really for someone who's not sort of an everyday reader of poetry you're going to pick up perhaps like a book that has a, a sort of medal emblazoned on the front Right, so um, so that aspect of it, yeah, being at the right places, meeting the right people, being on the right award committees, and then occasionally writing to the right style um, that will that will get you readers. Those th those seem to be the sort of differences between just wanting readers and being a careerist. Okay, we have one more question, and. Uh... 
I think it's an appropriate one. What role does criticism, both as an art form in itself and as a matter of public discussion, play in the development of careerism? Hmm. Well, um, career uh, criticism, excuse me, is that a is that a tricky place right now? Because largely because of you know the technological revolution we're undergoing, uh, and I've written about how in many venues that used to reliably publish criticism, it's being kind of pushed to the side for uh, what someone once just called book memes, but also Q and A's and profiles and these sort of like uh, author commoditizing, uh, author commoditizing um, forms, advertisements for selves that Karn was talking about with the, the, these sort of meta higher publicity forms of writing. Um, so I don't know, as a critic myself, I tend to, I try to just think of myself as a person writing about um, American literature who happens to be writing about American literature produced by people who happen to be alive. And to think of it, uh, I mean, I don't know. Um, careerist wise, I, I think of my career as a disaster. So I, I don't <laughs> think about it too much. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have health insurance. My bank account is pretty low, um, but I love writing pieces and publishing them in magazines like Book Forum. So thank you. Well, don't you think that uh, that th that writers are aware that because of virtue signaling among critics, there are certain subjects that are going to be treated with um, less scrutiny. I mean, this was where kind of the American dirt blurbing controversy, right, was that yeah, yeah. everyone was like, "This is such an important subject. It's such a painful, traumatic story." How can one how can one possibly write a negative review about this? And that kind of encourages a marketplace for those kinds of books. So I think criticism has really dropped the ball. I think there's you know um, too many authors reviewing other authors and just sort of back scratching and back slapping. And unfortunately, even professional critics doing the same thing all the time. I don't want to name them, but there's like one fairly prominent one I feel like who only gives positive reviews to every book that has ever come out. So I don't, I don't think that the criticism is helping this at all. It's not you, Christian, just so you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I caught that. Um, you could stop reviewing living people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's a recuperative, um, I mean, it, it's also just like the critic is only one you know, piece of a, of a larger reviewing industry. So, you know, I've tried to pitch, you know, lots of academic monographs that I, I wish more people would read, but, you know, it's, 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 you know, the resources are slim, but I, I do sort of want to think about Saeed's secular criticism um, and how he, he really did see it in this line of sort of like, um, a lot of them were Western Marxists, um, Auerbach in particular, where criticism is like, um, a form of revolutionary, like it's insurrectory, right? So criticism, yes, like perhaps Quran is right. We're not in a good place, whatever American- so That's a nightmare too, insurrection. I don't want it, like as a novelist, that frightens me equally. <laughs> okay. It turns out I care, I just want positive criticism. I was wrong, I take it back. Yeah, okay, just back to positive, <laughs> anyway, but I don't know. I, I actually do think like thinking of the, the criti critical, you know, a, judgment doesn't necessarily have, like a said, judgment doesn't necessarily have to be critical, but yes, like right. I see that as our, our, our job, right? I mean, to, to Jane's point, like one, I mean, one, one thing is just to think about what you want criticism to do or what it is you want a review to do. And often, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I think 
there are some people who want a review to simply give you a kind of thumbs up or thumbs down. Should I buy this or should I not buy this? But then, you know, I think all of the people here tonight do so much more with their writing. And I think one of the things they do is just teach you how to, all three of you, I think, teach people how to think about these books and offer sort of frameworks for contextualizing and understanding them in history. And when you write about things that aren't new, you find a way to make the historical objects of the past speak to us in our present. And that seems to me like a kind of wonderful task for criticism in the present. Um, and at least one very kind of small way to try to resist criticism's total co-optation um, by the what people in the chat have been calling the literary industrial complex. <laughs> Guys, it's like 3 a.m. in Berlin and we're not at a club, so I really All right. like to yeah. <laughs> Hey, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. This has been amazing. Um, thank you for your time and uh, just for all the, all the thoughtful comments. I want to say uh, really quickly, thank you to everyone for attending. Um, if you do not subscribe to Book Forum, I encourage you to subscribe. Uh, and uh, I want to thank really quickly uh, my colleagues, um, Dave O'Neill, Namara Smith, uh, Lizzie Hardman, uh, and also the publishers of Book Forum, Tony Kerner, Danielle McConnell, and Kate Koza. And uh, yeah, thanks. This has been wonderful. And uh, have a great night. Yeah, thank you guys. That was awesome. Bye, everybody.